very much for coming to the lecture. We think that it is very timely, actually, to have a lecture about the importance of arms trade in the world. For those of us who have, for instance, been following the Munich uh, Security Conference just this past weekend, have heard all about the threats that we're facing and that are emanating out of the Kremlin and spreading across all the way to Western Europe, aside, of course, of the continuing threat of jihadism and Islamic State and other uh, terrorist outfits that threaten our states, our values, our civilizations. <coughs> then, on the other side of the Atlantic, there's a new president that, in one of his first speeches, uh, promised to rebuild the American military as if it, it had ever been debuilt or deconstructed or, or left alone to decay. Uh, but he promised that he would reinvest in the military uh, as you've never seen before, as he repeats on every occasion. So the arms trade <laughs> is not an issue of the 60s or the 70s. It's very much an issue for the coming years that will define, uh, although it will not be upfront and up public, it will not be transparent, but it will still continue to define international relations, trade relations, and the possibilities of peace and the threats of war. So we're absolutely happy to have two international experts with us tonight to give you introductions into what it is that we're talking about when we talk about the arms trade and, uh, and the whole networks that exist and the, the networks of interests that are lying behind the actual trade. We will first uh, have um, Samuel Perlo Freeman, uh, who is currently uh, working for the World Peace Foundation in the United States. Where is it? Austin. Boston, <laughs> close to Boston. Um, before that, Sam has been working for nine years for CIPRI, the all famous Swedish Institute uh, for Peace Studies, where he was looking into uh, to the, the military expenditures, and today he is more invested in, in arms trade and what corruption uh, goes with that trade. So without further ado, I would like to ask each of the two speakers to give us a 20, 25 max uh, minutes introduction uh, into what they see as crucial aspects of arms trade and, and the corruption that goes with it, after which we will engage in, with, in a discussion, in a debate with the public. Okay. Thank you very much, G and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, the area that I'm researching at the moment focuses specifically on the arms trade and corruption. Uh, the arms trade being one of the most corrupt legal businesses in the world, something that will maybe come as a surprise to a few of you, and certainly none of you who've just seen the film Shadow World. Andrew, of course, uh, will speak after me, is the expert on corruption in the arms trade, having seen it in first, at first hand and attempted to investigate it in South Africa. Um, but I'll start by talking a little bit about the arms trade more generally. <coughs> it's an opportune time for it. Uh, Citri, my uh, former employer, has just released <coughs> its annual figures on the global arms trade showing that the volume of major conventional weapons transfers between countries is over the past five years at its highest level since the Cold War. Uh, it's been, it fell quite significantly after the Cold War, but it's been growing rapidly for many years now, especially since 9-11 essentially unabated. How big is the global arms trade? That's very hard to say if we're talking about financial terms. Citri's figures 
seek to give a measure of volume because prices are very often not actually known or not revealed. Um, so exact financial figures for some countries, say especially Chinese exports, for example, are very hard to know. Uh, at a rough estimate, I'd say it's probably not far off $100 billion a year, give or take. Um, now, one confusion about this, one thing that uh, always annoyed us at CIPRI is when, for example, <coughs> we released our figures on military spending of about $1.7 trillion a year, and people would talk about this as global arms spending, which is not the case, as most military spending is actually running costs, salaries and pensions and fuel and food and basic supplies. So maybe uh, a quarter, very roughly, of that total um, is actual arms purchases. And then the international arms trade is only a minority of that. Most of the arms that are sold in the world are actually sold by American companies to the American government. Maybe, maybe not quite most, but at least a very <coughs> large proportion. And certainly most of the arms in the world are sold by the major arms producing com countries, companies in, uh, in those countries to their own governments. Who are the big buyers of arms internationally on the international market. It's the countries that have quite a lot of money to spend. They may or may not have particular senses of threat or conflicts uh, that motivate them to spend it. But they're also the countries, by and large, that aren't very good at producing their own arms. So uh, <coughs> the biggest importers of arms uh, are India and Saudi Arabia. India has been trying for a very long time to build a domestic arms industry, but with only limited success. China used to be the world's largest arms importer. They're now, I think, something like uh, third place. They're certainly the second largest military spender after the USA, but they've been increasingly developing their own arms industry. Uh, and buying their uh, domestically arms, and only a minority of their arms are bought abroad, mostly from Russia. The big exporters, the USA, of course, is the biggest. In volume terms, just amount of stuff, if you like, by Cipri's measure, Russia is very easily the second place and not far behind the United States. If you're looking in financial terms, it's probably the UK with Russia just behind them. <coughs> then France, Germany, and China are amongst the other biggest of the exporters. But there's a large number of countries, including, of course, Belgium here, fairly well down the list, that produce and sell arms both domestically and abroad. Both the domestic arms trade from companies to their own governments and the international arms trade uh, are very strongly affected by corruption. It's often the international scandals that most often come to attention, but uh, the domestic arms <coughs> procurement in a lot of countries is, is, is also very much the subject of corruption. When you read the defense press about why countries are buying arms, it will always be in security terms uh, that it's explained. Uh, they want to keep up with their neighbors, or they're afraid of Iran, or they're uh, concerned about China's actions, and what have you. And this may be partly true. Or frequently, it will be explained in this catch-all term, modernization. Uh, they need to modernize their, their armed forces and their equipment, which, which really doesn't mean very much. Um, so, I mean, if your car is getting old, you might decide, well, you might decide, 
I live in a big urban area, there's great public transport, I can walk and cycle, it's healthier, I don't need a new car. Or you might say, I can keep this old banger going for another year or two. Or you might buy a used car, fairly cheap, but good enough for your purposes, for a new car. Or you might buy a Mercedes-Benz. So many of these would be lots of options for modernization and it would, you know, depend on how much money you've got, what your needs are, and, well, maybe other things like masculine ego or whatever. But um, probably most people are not just going to go out and buy the Mercedes Benz because their, their old Ford uh, is, is getting a bit old. Um, so when countries say they want to modernize, you know, you really need to ask the question, why, what do they actually need? And countries are, on the one hand, very good at inventing security threats. At, and arms manufacturers and traders are, of course, as well as uh, defense advocates and lobbyists, are very good at persuading people about just how terrible the threats are out there and how their products are just what they need to keep them secure. Um, <coughs> but uh, on, on the other hand, um, there are typically a whole lot of other motivations going on behind arms purchases. Very often, decisions about military procurement and military spending are severely lacking in transparency. And especially when you come to complex weapon systems, major fighter aircrafts, exactly how countries are going up about weighing one option <coughs> against another, it's a highly technical matter. There's a lot of different uh, offers and packages involved with each thing. There can be training uh, involved, maintenance and supplies. There can be offsets, which I'm sure Andrew will talk about more. There can be political re relationships to consider. Countries buying from the United States um, often feel that they are, they're not just buying the weapons, they're buying the security relationship with the USA. Uh, they're buying protection, essentially. And I gather that this is one of the biggest arguments for why Belgium uh, needs the, F the F-35, the most expensive military aircraft in history, which doesn't actually work yet, and which uh, it's and is still going up in price, and it's really hard to see exactly what use a country like Belgium would have for it, assuming that is that any country would have a use for it. So that sort of political relationship can be another factor that motivates these decisions, and along with, with all this complex package of uh, differing motivations which are all justified under sort of headings of patriotism and national security and covered very often with a veil of secrecy or at least so great complexity that very few people are actually capable of understanding what's going on even if the information is out there. It's very easy for corruption to work its way in as one of the key motivations. So if you're buying your car for yourself and your family, well, I mean, it's not much point to the car dealer bribing you to buy the Mercedes instead of the used uh, car. Uh, but for the procurement decision makers, the ministers and civil servants and heads of the armed forces and so forth that are deciding what to spend the public's money on, then the bribes that are offered by arms companies can very often be one of the key motivating factors that are behind the decision on the what first of all which uh, system to buy who to buy from but even on why to buy this stuff in the first place and arguably in a lot of cases including the South Africa one that Andrew will talk about 
if we're talking about Saudi Arabia's huge arms purchases from Britain in the 90, from the 1980s, the Al Yamama deals, arguably a lot of these deals would not have happened at all, uh, would not have been seen as necessary at all without it offering the potential for uh, enormous personal enrichment on part of the decision makers. Essentially, where the military is subject to very little transparency and even less accountability, even less possibility of people being prosecuted in the buyer countries for the corrupt decisions that they take, um, then uh, the temptation for, uh, to, to just use the military budget as essentially a giant money laundering operation can be enormous. In Nigeria, for example, with the ready excuse of fighting Boko Haram, uh, the national security advisor of the previous president, good luck, Jonathan, uh, a guy called Lieutenant Colonel Sambo Dasuki, may have, between himself and his cronies, stolen up to $15 billion over eight years of money that was supposed to go into purchasing arms and to paying the general costs of the Nigerian armed forces, but which produced very little to show for it. Angola... Um, has an awful lot of oil revenue, less than the last couple of years with the fall in prices. They became, they should be a relatively well-off country uh, for, for the region. Uh, they actually have one of the highest rates of poverty and malnutrition and ill health in the world. They have the highest military budget in sub-Saharan Africa, and they have soldiers who are malnourished because so much of the money is just diverted into uh, the pockets of the, the elites, of the generals and of the businessmen that are their cronies. That's perhaps an extreme case. So it's not just in the arms decision that this so decisions that this sort of case happens, but they are often the single biggest deals that provide the single biggest opportunities for bribes and they are also the ones that are least likely to be subject to transparency and that are most technically complex where decisions are taken by fewest people. So even when we're not in these extreme cases of corruption like Angola, there's much more possibility for getting away with it and much more motivation in terms of the size of the deal. However, as they say, it takes two to tango. And we should not just focus on the buyers when looking at the reasons for arms trade corruption. The seller's side of the market is equally important. And Western arms companies have shown themselves to be all too willing to bribe their way around the world uh, as part of the competition for selling their weapons. And their governments have if not been, if not actively complicit in this corruption, extremely willing to tolerate it. Why is that? Of course, the first thing that politicians will say when justifying arms deals, whether against concerns about human rights or conflict or corruption or whatever, is jobs. The arms industry actually does not produce all that many jobs. It's not a huge part of the economy. When I said that figure of 100 billion for the global international arms trade, that, that is a tiny, tiny proportion of world trade. Is it about half a percent of, of global trade? It's not that significant. In, even in a major producer like Britain, the arms industry as a whole is maybe 1% of GDP of which maybe half of that is exports. And moreover, as a capital-intensive industry, it's not that great at creating jobs. Of course, any one major arms deal will involve a lot of jobs concentrated in one go. Uh, 
education creates far more jobs, but it's spread out over the country, and it's, it's harder to say, well, this school will create 5,000 jobs. So it's easy to use the jobs excuse as something that's big and headline-grabbing. This little town in Lancashire um, will, uh, will, will curl up and die if its arms plant closes, which will happen if the, if the company doesn't get this one particular deal. But governments in following neoliberal economic policies, as they have been throughout uh, the Western world over the past 30 years, have shown far less concern about jobs when it comes to any other industry than the arms industry. They have been far more willing to let the market take its course and industries to go to the wall. And of course, if the market were to take its course, there is no way that you would have three separate major combat aircraft being produced in Europe at the same time, the Eurofighter, the Dassault Rafale, and the, the Swedish Saab Gripen, uh, along with the various American options and the Russians and the Chinese. There are, by contrast, only two makers of major civilian uh, uh, jet aircraft, jumbo jet aircraft, Boeing and Airbus. So if the market were to take its course like it's allowed to everywhere else, then a large part of these industries would not exist. So what's going on is not about economics. It's about the determination of countries to keep their domestic arms industries going. <coughs> it's part of this idea that national security, national status requires military power, and military power requires the ability to produce your own arms no one produces them completely independently, but to produce them as autonomously as possible. But if a country like Britain or France were to lose their capability, say, to produce major combat aircraft, then their status in the world would go down. Uh, whether this is true or not, how important this is, how this should compare with other concerns like the effect of arms on conflict, like the corruption in conflict, that's a very different matter. But this idea that a major country needs its own arms industry is extremely widely held. As I say, India has invested huge amounts of money in trying to build up its own domestic arms trade industry to wean itself off imports with very little success, but they continue to pump large sums of money into that while at the same time buying a lot of arms overseas. But so for a country like Britain and France, they have a rather small domestic market for arms, especially when we're talking about these once-a-generation major systems. The United States, the companies, can get by mostly by selling to the US government, Boeing and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and so forth. They can keep their production lines going on domestic demand, <coughs> with exports being an added bonus on the side. But for countries like Britain and France, until recently Russia, uh, which has only recently started spending heavily on buying arms again itself from its own industry, exports are far more important. And this explains part of the reason for why governments are so willing to tolerate or even actively collude in corruption. The British government in the 1970s, the MOD, would work directly with the arms companies in paying bribes. Later they've kept more of an arms length relationship, but their willing to tolerate it has no better exemplar than when Tony Blair ordered the, the serious fraud office to call off its investigation of BAE's arms sales to Saudi Arabia, the Al Yamama deals, uh, on the grounds of the enormous bribes that were paid as part of those deals. The excuse, well, one of the excuses was jobs, of course. The other was that the Saudis had threatened to withdraw intelligence cooperation, but they and this would lead to blood on the streets of London. But uh, 
when the UK uh, always is, is so self-righteous about how we don't give in to terrorism, it seems that they were in this case very quick to give in to the threat of terrorism. The reason is that BAE systems, the absolute core of the British arms industry, um, is so dependent on its, ex its business with Saudi Arabia. It's been the lifeline that's kept the company going over the past 30 years. I believe it was £43 billion pounds that they got in revenues up to 2007, and that clock is still very much ticking. BAE has 5,000 employees in Saudi Arabia keeping the Saudi Air Force going so that it can keep on bombing Yemen. So this is the reason why Britain was willing to trash its global reputation as a leader of efforts against corruption, uh, which was very important in terms of Tony Blair's big agenda in, in Africa, for example, uh, of uh, promoting good governance. They were quite happy to trash that in aid of keeping <laughs> BAE systems going. Of course, there's also the company's private profit motive, but it's not really much better where you have nationalized arms industries. So, for example, the French uh, company DCNS that makes warships and submarines uh, is mostly state-owned, but rarely seem to sell their uh, products overseas without there being major bribes paid alongside it. Indeed, uh, in the 1990s, when, for example, selling uh, ships to Pakistan and Taiwan, the French export promotion agency was even tasked with paying the commissions, to the bribes to the, the foreign decision makers, which at the time was legal in France. What wasn't legal was when some of those bribes were channeled backwards into France to fund the Prime Minister's uh, presidential election campaign, <laughs> which got them into trouble. Um, incidentally, this is one of the reasons you see much less corruption of that sort in American politics, because that's perfectly legal. They don't have campaign finance limits. So uh, they can have enormous campaign contributions and they don't have to call it a bribe. So for the suppliers, as for the buyers, the motivation to <coughs> tolerate and indeed encourage corruption to keep this illusion of a country's status through maintaining their defence industry overwhelms any other considerations of the desire to promote good governance, transparency, even security in the world. And this, these are some of the factors that make the arms industry probably the most corrupt legal trade in the world. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. very much Samuel for uh, giving very much uh, to your time and for being very very clear and very uh, transparent in what the argument is and how you build it up and even providing the conclusion in a way that I would not be able to do better so I leave it immediately up uh, to Andrew to follow up with his part of this lecture